Hello everyone, welcome to the Intimacy Coordination Masterclass at the 9th Indies Film Festival dedicated to emerging filmmakers and film lovers, running with free sessions until the 30th of April, reaching more audiences with the, with the support of the BFI, awarding funds from the National Lottery. We're really excited to welcome you to this event. Before we begin, I've got some housekeeping. Uh, this event is pre-recorded, but we do have the chat function open where you can talk about the session, the festival, or just film in general. But please do keep it focused and don't say anything that's offensive or personal. Uh, we asked for some questions in advance for Ita, so we'll be putting those to her in the session. And without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce Ita O'Brien. Uh, Ita is an intimacy coordinator and movement director with credits on hugely popular shows such as Sex Education, I May Destroy You, Normal People, and most recently It's a Sin, uh, among so many others. So Ita, it's a real pleasure to have you for the Indus Festival. Thank you so much for your time. Gage, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you so much for asking me. Oh, brilliant. Well, I'm, I've got a million questions to ask you, but let's just jump straight in <laughs> to the ones. Uh, basically, what, can you just give us an overview of what an intimacy coordinator or intimacy director does um, on, on film and television sets? So an intimacy coordinator is a practitioner who brings a professional structure to the intimate content so it can be considered, spoken about, dealt with through a professional structure um, that can you believe wasn't there before. Um, so if you think of the role of a stunt coordinator that's going to you know, be brought on board by a producer, they're going to have seen, oh, look, there's a fight there. We need a stunt coordinator. We're going to put money aside to employ a stunt coordinator. We're going to um, speak with the director about what the, um, what the fight is, what the, what the director wants, what their vision is. Speak to the stunt coordinator going, great, this is what we want. The stunt coordinator will go, great, well, there's this risk here. You're getting people to pretend they're fighting, falling on the floor. We'll put crash mats in place. We'll teach techniques about how to throw a punch. Um, and then we'll choreograph it absolutely clearly so that everybody knows what's happening. The actors feel confident, feel empowered. It serves the storytelling. And once we put it in front of the camera, everybody's safe. It's very exciting, it's serving the storytelling and we're creating a great scene. So that's what was put in place, you know, for fights. And also if there was a dance, say your beautiful tango in Baz Luhrmann's um, Moulin Rouge, um, but with intimate scenes, there was nothing. Um, but that's now what we're bringing. So that analogy of just that professional practice, making sure there's a risk assessment, making sure there's agreement and consent and that's of um, what someone's happy to do regarding simulated sexual content wise, regarding the degrees of nudity and regarding touch, what's happy, what, where are they happy to be touched? And then the clear techniques, you know, this is a body dance. Anytime two people come to touch with each other, it's a body dance, just like a tango, just like a fight, putting in place clear choreography, teaching skills, and then choreographing with everywhere that is in the actor's agreement and consent, just like a fight to make a brilliant scene everybody's happy and really do um, good storytelling. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is, it's very much just like a, you know, the, it's, the, it's the attitude of it being like a fight scene or a, or a, a, a dance is, you know, it's the exact same thing. It's yeah, yeah. two people that need to be choreographed and need to be safe on set. So yeah, absolutely. And what, what does your typical day on set look like? So when, you, when you're on, for example, normal people, what, what was your day like? <laughs> Um, so it's interesting that you say the day on set, um, as I described with the stunt coordinator, you know, the, the body of the work or the, or what's going to allow that day on set to run smoothly, to run efficiently, to not take up too much time is all the preparation. Mm -hmm. Um, so the day on set, you know, just like a, an iceberg, the, th the tip of the iceberg is what 10% that you see above the water and all of that preparation work is, um, what goes on before the day on set, which is the conversations with the director, conversations then therefore the, with the director with their actors, then the conversations that I will have with those actors, conversations subsequently I will have with um, the wardrobe department, with the makeup department, with the um, first ADs to hold a closed set well, with the second ADs to make sure that there's time put in place in the schedule for rehearsals. Um, um, and once all that, that's put in place, then it means a day on set can work efficiently. So you say on normal people, I've got into a rhythm of actually I check in with Lenny at breakfast to go, great, we spoke about the scene, any th thoughts, any changes, what do you want? Great, I'll go and check in with Paul and Daisy. How are you feeling today? Any concerns? Check that out, go and say hello to wardrobe department. Um, and then invariably if there's been a rehearsal already, then we'll refine the choreography. That'll be the actor director, you know, rehearsal, we'll re, you know, if we've 
like I say, if we've looked at the scene already, we'll rediscuss anything change, interrogating the scene, why is it there? How's it serving the storytelling? What's it telling us about the um, each of those characters and um, each of those characters in relationship? And all of that information goes into then, that's what we'll put into the choreography so that the actors are full of um, really all of that detail, all of that intention, all of that physicality that are these characters, not them, is really clearly considered and then put in place, choreographed, so there's absolutely clear physical structure. So the actors um, feel personally safe so they can artistically give their all to this intimate moment. Um, it means the director can note them, go, oh, okay, that was great, but can you be a bit more vulnerable here? Or can you have a little bit more passion there? You know, when it's clearly known, the actors aren't trying to wing it on the hoof. You know, there's a structure so it's repeatable. The director can, you know, bring all that nuance. The actors can, you know, have that sense as you do with any scene, you know, that they can, within the actual structure, then they can be different. They can bring their, their fresh impulse for each and every take, creating something that's exciting, nuanced. And um, yeah, and, um, and then also what we put in place is that um, at the end of the day, that, that I make sure that if someone's really been enlivened with that sexual energy, that we make sure that we bookend it, that just as we're looking at how do you warm up, how do you prepare to step from personal self into character, also looking at then at the end of the day, great, you've created a beautiful scene. Let's honor yourself for that. Let's put in techniques so you can step back away from that character, away from all that sexual energy, back to your personal self so that you can really maintain a really lovely professional structure within which that intimate content is performed and you're stepping away, um, you know, back to your personal self, ready to reset either for the next scene or for the next day. Yeah, I mean, debriefing that uh, uh, kind of very emotional, overwhelming, moment is is arguably just as important as the preparation mm -hmm. for it I can I can completely see that I believe I don't know if you've got any kind of equipment or products that you use on set um that you might be able to show us or kind of talk us through um I don't know if, you, if you've got any <laughs> any fun any stuff here. <laughs> fun tools so, um, yeah so, so obviously a big part of what keeps the actor comfortable is um you know when there are degrees of nudity that they're taken care of and also that nothing there's no nudity that's gratuitous so even if you've got a scene that appears that the actors are completely naked first of all if there's um simulated sexual content it's not suitable we're in the workplace it's not suitable for naked genitalia to be touching it's not suitable for fluids to possibly be shared in that way so genitalia is always covered the least you'll have is what's called a um hebu or shibu so the genitalia area is covered um we then have sort of things like um you know dance belts um the next layer up um and and for um you know or flesh colored g-strings um obviously we have different colors that really honor the actor's skin tones um and then flesh colored shorts you know so for example if you have a simulated sex scene you've got a wide top they appear completely naked by the time you get to the two shot like from the hip bones up then they can be putting flesh colored shorts on we have um nipple daisies um you know, for the, for for those who don't, don't want the, the the areola and the nipple to be to be seen, we also have more complete breast coverings. Um, you know, so we've got so, so we've got a whole degree of of um, equipment that um that give the inference of nudity while honouring the actor's boundaries. And then also we you know for all of these things that might need sticking on, we we've, we've got various degrees of tape. But of course, it's also very important that we honour. Um, someone's skin tone so we have tape that's in in all the different um, tones um, so that again we make sure that we've got a tape that um, you know that is is of the right skin tone for, for that particular actor um, um, and then invariably um, sort of wardrobe or costume will have this but, but I do have my <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mince use to, my little my little box of mints um <laughs> so there we go that's that's some of the equipment we we also make genitalia cushions so that we can put extra barriers between people and and um you know and and then look at how we choreograph as well so that um we're looking at what body part can be pressed into body part so that it looks like there's penetration through to orgasm but actually we're looking at techniques that on one side it reads where the camera is but actually if you came around the other side you could see there's actually no pubic bone to pubic bone happening yeah 
it's just a, a camera technique isn't it and, and, just and like... physical technique as well it's it's That's remarkable it. it's it's a it's a very carefully constructed jigsaw <laughs> which is <laughs> which sounds brilliant um and you mentioned obviously when you have these conversations with directors and producers and then going to the actors and and having making sure that everyone's on the same page how do you manage forming that desire for a certain scene to go a certain way um from a director or a writer or a producer um while also maintaining the actor's preferences and also just general health and welfare how do you kind of navigate that if, if they're conflicting so 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 the overarching that i say there's three fundamental tenets to intimacy coordination um so agree um open um conversation and transparency and then agreement and consent and then clear choreography so in that open communication and transparency, I mean, that that's all that preparation period, that pathway through to all those conversations. So that, you know, and I always, so I speak for the director, but then it's really important that the director is a person that speaks to the actor first mm -hmm. about their vision. It's important that they, the vision for that scene doesn't come from the intimacy coordinator. This is everything serving the director's vision, serving the writing. So the director will speak to the actors. And then once they've done that, they will sign off and say, great, you can now speak to the actors. Then I'll go, great, this is what you want. What are you happy with? So for example, I spoke with um, a director and he was saying, well, you know, if an actor reads that it's a moment of um, masturbation in the script, well, it's obvious what's wanted of him. So why should there be any problem? But I'm saying there's so many ways that you can film that moment of um, self-pleasure you know, one way that might be really compromising that particular actor's boundaries and another way that is going to give you all the nuance and all the beauty and all that journey through of self-pleasure, um, if through to orgasm, if that's what's wanted, through different camera angles. Something might be written and a director think it's really clear that that's what's asked of the actor. So, for example, um, you know, an actor might say, you know, I, you know, in that moment, an actor might go, actually, I'm happy for my hand to be seen. I'm happy for that rhythm to be seen. Um, um, yeah. Um, well, for another actor, they go, I don't, you know, I don't want anything from my waist, from below my waist to be seen, but we can still choreograph that moment really clearly. Or they might say, I'm happy for a back view and we can have that rhythm through to orgasm if it's, you know, there's so many different ways that that same scene can be shot that honor the actor's boundaries, that honor the actor's um, degrees of nudity that are being seen. So, so it's interesting, and what's, what's the word conflict? You know, so it's interesting that perhaps in the past, you know, and I actually I was checking in with an actor this morning and, um, and she said that, you know, in the past, when there was intimate content that she was asked to do and she was saying no, and she was labeled a difficult actor purely because she was calling her boundaries. Mm. Now that's not being difficult. Actually, it's actually being responsible because again, my intention and what I'm sharing with the industry is if you have an actor that's been pushed outside their boundaries, you're, what you're gonna get on screen is all of their personal uncomfortableness, personal um, tensions that are to do with what they, you know, those their personal boundaries being overstepped. Whereas what you want is an actor that's free and open in free flow, being able to be happy and open personally so that they can bring all of their acting skills to really serving this moment of this character and this character storytelling. And as soon as you get someone to do something that isn't right for them, then actually the, the purity of the actor being able to focus on the storytelling and give you a really brilliant scene is gone. So, so actually it's an actor being responsible by listening to themselves sharing clearly their boundaries and that's what the difference is so, so so you know hopefully we can we have taken that word conflict out of it it's about this is what we want as um you know this is the storytelling this is a physical storytelling we want and then we're going and now we're checking out with the actor what are your boundaries and now how do we take with everything that is in the play that's in your agreement and consent along with what the storytelling is want is is wanted and now we, we work creatively within, you know, within those boundaries to create the same storytelling in a creative way. Mm. So, so the pathway, that word conflict, hopefully can, can, can fall away. Is irrelevant because yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's open and honest conversation, isn't it? Right. It's just, right. it's just having that, 
and I think there's it definitely comes down to there's there's definitely some sense of awkwardness and and kind of taboo when it comes to talking about sex which just needs to be resolved <laughs> because if, if it is an open and honest conversation between production and and actors and talent typically you know those those types of things can just be resolved and, and made you know as you said there's there's so many ways that you could go around a scene while getting the, the vision of the director and and the the kind of the, the best performance from your actor and this is it you know we have the particularly on tv and film so there's different conversations to be had in theater um but um you know we've got cameras <laughs> we've got cameras that can be placed anywhere and and where um you know humanity is a species that we we work out our world through storytelling and we get things instantly. So for example, there was a script that was written where there was um, a rape scene and it was written on the bed um, where you know, the man comes over and you know, so there was that kind of explicit physicality written. Um, and the actress said, I'm not doing that. So what they ended up doing is they had the actress stood on a box. They had the actor with his hand as it were around her neck they showed a shot of the hand coming up and lifting the skirt. So you see the thigh and then you see a rhythm happening from here up. Um, and it was the storytelling of an abusive moment and a rape happening was absolutely clear, but was with physicalities and with, you know, um, moments of, of shots um, and with a rhythm that was, that was um, given that told the storytelling that was in the actor's agreement and consent that wouldn't have lessened the impact of the physical storytelling in any way, shape or form, um, but that it was completely shifted in its shape so that the actors um, were within their boundaries, happy with what was being shown and um, yeah, and not, you know, not having to go home feeling that they had performed something that left them traumatised. Yeah. And all, all, also it's a, it's a really creative so solution almost. It's, it's, you know, it's a creative way of thinking, OK, well, let how can we do this and I wondered what would be your you know what, what are the key things that a, a low budget or an independent production or a production by young people who are wanting to include scenes of intimacy um what can they do to ensure safety um you know close sets or time out words things like that um so yes yeah, so as far as um yeah so first of all as you can hear basic thing is um have those conversations. Um, and then also I say to everybody, if possible, storyboard the intimate content that you want. Because obviously you have text in a, in a, you know, in a, in your film, but when you get through to either anger, full on violence or full on love, the words fall away and you either get to a fight that's a physical storytelling or indeed intimacy is a physical storytelling. So you might have something written but an actor's going to know, or you want to share with everybody the clarity of what it is you want to create. So storyboard. So it's not just what you do, but how it's how it's filmed. And if you've got low budget, again, like I'm saying, um, be creative in how you tell the storytelling with camera angles and everything, so that you're keeping, you know, that the your budget low. Silhouettes great, you know, you know, doing something in silhouette. So again, you're not having to compromise. You're not having to ask somebody to be in nudity. So you have the lighting so it's low, but they can be in in you know in flesh colored you know um leggings and and leotard so have the inference of nudity while you know while you know not having to go to that place of you know really taking care of nudity wise just all all of those all of those creative aspects that you can use you know that particularly low budget um and um you know and you know and then really looking at why is that intimate scene there and um you know so, so and also being sparse you know sort of like close-up moments of, of body parts again where where um where creative beings all you need for an audience is to see a couple of different bits of bodies and moments to, that and we fill in don't we as an audience we fill in the rest of the storytelling and actually very often that's far more exciting storytelling than actually just seeing everything so those kind of ways are ways in which you can still have those kinds of intimate scenes while well, you know, helping yourself with a low budget to be efficient and creative in, in creating those moments. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as you say, it's it's also quite, you know, it is intimate and romantic if we have if we have these close-ups of like hands and things like which and hands is a massive one because hands are never portrayed in in kind of in in sex on screen typically through like 
pornography and things like that that's such a a thing that you could do so much with um and that's that's really intimate so i absolutely agree and also some of the things you shared there the with the dance belt and the tapes those are stuff that you can get relatively cheaply as well and, and as you say like full full body leotards and and tights and leggings things like that um and and you mentioned with the tapes having all all these different kind of cut flesh tone uh flesh tones to make sure the actors are represented do you do you have a say when it comes to representation on on screen or, or when it comes to in- intimate scenes like if something isn't represented well or or isn't done well do you have any say or is that more the director's choice so it's, it's interesting you say about things when, when things aren't done well. What, what I do have a say over is, you know, um, is, is whether, is how that scene is serving the storytelling. As I say, you know, what function is that scene um, doing? How is it pushing the storytelling forward? Why is that scene there? Um, what's it showing us about each of these characters and each of these characters in relationship? And as I said, what's, what's left an actor vulnerable in the past is when a scene is gratuitous, when it's literally only there, you know, as, as you know, working with the producer says, we want as much sex and nudity as we can get in this production. Well, that kind of attitude isn't about, you know, what function is that intimate content doing? And that to me is what's important. And that's what I will help to facilitate in that open communication with the directors. It's about interrogating that script, just as you would do with any other scene. And it very quickly becomes clear if um, if an image or a sexual act isn't actually there for any other reason than it being gratuitous, and that I will help with that open communication to call out, you know, and then to help invite um, that open communication with the director and the actors. I mean, invariably an actor will go, I don't want to do that. If something's outside, the, the clear reason for it being there, it feels gratuitous, it feels um, exposing, or, um, you know, can be as bad as feeling abusive. Mm. And I've done, done that in the past where a director's just wanted this particular very graphic image. And I've, you know, in my check-in with the director, I've been going, okay, so why do you want that image? What's the storytelling here? What's the power play? And this director, she just had that image fixated in her head. Um, and I was told by the producers, oh, these actors are now pushing back. They don't want to do some of the intimate content. And, um, and But when I checked in with the actors, they hadn't had that conversation with the director about that scene. They're just being told about it. So that's what we did as the intimacy coordinator facilitated, speaking back to the producers, saying, right, actually, we need just to facilitate that conversation now um, rather than waiting till the arc of the filming because this seems very concerning. That's what we put in place. And in that conversation with the director and the actors, um, interrogating the power play, what what the storytelling was, what the director really wanted, what the actors were happy with, they then became very excited in finding a new physicality, um, a new metaphor for what this moment of intimacy was about. And by the end of it, that image had fallen away. Mm -hmm. And what they had now created, they were all excited about it. They were all engaged with it. They all felt listened to, heard, empowered and autonomous and that's what we ended up creating for the for the production. So that's the kind of thing that we can help to do. And, and obviously, not only is it, um, of, you know, the, the right thing to do to make your actors and crew feel safe on set, but obviously, as you say, it, it translates on camera. You, the audience yeah. will be able to see the the benefits to the performance that having their actors being excited about filming a scene can do. So it it kind of feels like a no brainer. So yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's mad. And, and as, as you say, it's that, is that when you get over just talking openly about the sexual content, the sexual acts, you know, it doesn't matter how graphic they are, um, that then that then you can just throw out all the people's embarrassment and, you know, concerns and just get on talking professionally. And that's also what we invite language wise. Language is so important. And let's talk in an adult and professional manner about this content, which means using um, adult language, um, anatomical language. So not talking about, oh, you know, his tits or his cock, but talking about breasts, penis, talking about penetration, orgasm, withdrawal, um, so that we're just being detailed and precise, but adult and professional, and we're making sure that we're not using language that is objectifying, Mm. titivating or infantilizing that can be offensive. Yeah, thank you. And 
when it comes to representation as well, I mean, um, I know I know you didn't you didn't work on um, on, on Bridgerton, for example, which um, the, there's definitely s- 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 scenes of sexual intimacy there that are, you know, questionable, and especially the the way that that's represented on screen. Um, do you? What's your opinion on on scenes like that? And I know, for example, I may destroy you again has scenes of intimacy which you choreographed and, and a, a scenes of assault as well in particular that that were represented in in a certain way that's compared to Bridgerton I guess <laughs> and how I just wanted to know what you what you thought about that um yeah so so our role as the intimacy coordinator is to honor the storytelling honor the writing and then within each scene, bring our best to give the detail to each of those scenes that everything that's written is, you know, we, you know, through the clear choreography and through the clear conversation, we can make sure that each and every beat of that moment of is um is given its time and space. Um, you know, it's not fudged. So for example, in the assault scene um with the character of Kwame in I May Destroy You, you know, first of all, you have that character engaging in a moment of consensual sex. Um with a, a grinder hookup, um, and then as he's trying to leave, the the um, you know the the grinder hookup um, stops him from leaving, and then actually goes into a moment of assault where um, he masturbates sort of on top of him. Um, so it's not penetration, but it you know he takes down his clothes. Um, so again, and that was very detailed as well, you know, to make sure that we show that it's not penetration. You know, but obviously you don't see you know you know our actors are in their genitalia um, coverings. So, um, so again, it's nuanced. It's very clearly assault. It's very clearly not within that character's agreement and consent. So, how we showed that. So, so again, for me, what's really important with abusive subject matter is that you're taking care even more of um, of not of the not just phys- physically, but emotionally and psychologically by really clearly separating. It's even more important for me that we very mechanically you know, with no emotion whatsoever, go through the choreography, anchor that choreography so it's really, really secure. So that then the actor is has has that as a really clear frame, because of course, if there's any degree of violence within the character's storytelling, you want to make sure that that violence is not happening for real. So things like there was a moment that the hand went over the wrist. And so you're making sure that you're employing um, stage combat techniques where it's the person, you know, the person who's got his hand over is not the one that's holding the energy that the person that's being held. So it's his that he's pushing his hand into that hand um, so that they're in control. So, and so, so th- those techniques take a bit more practicing, but that's what's so important. So the physical shape is anchored even more clearly so that then each and every take they can release into the emotional storytelling. Um, and um, so again, you know, that the, the storytelling is honored um, and then it's even more important at the end of the day, after those scenes, that that um, that everybody then is is um, puts in place that practice of really honouring where they've gone to, and this is really important for obviously the victim, but even more so the person playing the perpetrator. And very often we look to saying we've got to take care of the victim, but actually the person stepping into that place of the perpetrator is is doing even more of a service, is you know finding that place within themselves for that character in order to, to serve that. So for everybody, making sure you step back, honor what you've done and um, and letting go, yeah, so that you're not keep it, ke- taking a residue of that dynamic with you. Um, and then as you have mentioned earlier, um, that um, we're taking care of a production. So of course, you know, we, I've spoken a lot about the director and, and the actors, but we're taking care of everybody, including the crew. So things like nakedness, you know, this is a place of work. Um, so it's really important that, um, that, yeah, that everybody's taken care of in a place of work. So for example, nudity is from action to cut and at all other times the actor should be covered. Now you might think that this is purely for the actor, but no, you know, I've had situations where the set's been absolutely boiling. There's been a toweling dressing gown and the actor's gone, I don't want to put that back on. I'm sweating, I'm boiling. So they've said walking around the set in between takes with nothing but the genitalia covering on. Well, great, you know, that might be, you know, by that time the actors might got very comfortable in, in that degree of nakedness, but this is the workplace for the crew. Mm-hmm. It's not suitable for a crew to be confronted with someone's nudity in their workplace. So, you know, so that's where, 
you know, you're taking care of the crew that way. And then in particular with abusive subject matter, to have that awareness that we don't know what um, has happened in people's um, journey in their lives, and you don't know who are going to be triggered. And that could be cast or crew, so that you make sure that you have that awareness and you put in place perhaps a designated, um, you know, mental health awareness person, so that anybody who might find that subject matter that's been filmed that day to be, you know, um, triggering for them that they have somewhere to go to, to take care of them, um, not just physically, but emotionally and psychologically. It's so important. I think that the sets should have the, these roles regardless of the scenes that are, yeah. that are introduced to you, even if there isn't any clear scenes of intimacy or, or clear scenes where mental health might be affected from cast and crew. There's such pivotal roles. Um, so I think, you know, I think that's it's it's a really important job to have on set. Um, that's right. And particularly as people, you know, have been self-isolating, have been shielding, might have been carers, might be living by themselves um, in our in these lockdown times of COVID. And um, and all of those up someone's mental health and their vulnerability. You know, I you know, my sister lives by herself and I and and the impact of that is really hard. So, and, and then also, you know, on the productions that I've been working on, we've got the joy of working and because we're robustly testing or the productions are robustly testing, then we can still create the intimate content, including through to kissing and that close contact. But for all of us in the crew, we're wearing, you know, our masks, sometimes masks and visors. Um, and then there's also that added anxiety of, you know, with that daily testing, and then as happens, you're like, oh, someone has actually tested now positive. It means God, everything's got to pause. We've got to have a hiatus for two weeks. That ongoing concern causes a particular anxiety um, because of that lack of, um, you know, you're on the edge of like, is this going to, is this production going to be able to continue filming for the duration that it's scheduled to do so? Um, and so all of that means that our anxieties and our vulnerabilities are heightened and I, and, and I think we need to, um, you know, say, yes, I think our mental health um, well, well-being practitioners are really important. And, and we can work then also mm -hmm. as intimacy coordinators hand in hand with them. Um, so I think as the role of intimacy coordinators becoming common practice, I absolutely agree that I think the um, an, um, artist well-being practitioner or, uh, you know, health um, well-being practitioners should become commonplace in all productions. Yeah. Oh, how how would someone so for example if anyone's watching this thinking this might be a role for me this might be a career that I'm interested in being involved with or starting with how would you go about getting into this as a career are there, are there any opportunities available because it is quite a new role so I had an ongoing pathway of training before COVID hit um, and of course, you know, for me, the productions that I'm working on, they've got incredible insurance in place to, to mitigate and cover um, should anybody get ill. For me, with my training at the moment, I had, don't have the capacity to have that kind of robust um, and very expensive insurance in place. So at the moment, um, the people who are on the pathway of training, I'm able to continue because they've done the basic training, but this is a body art and this is very much how someone holds themselves in the space. Um, and so I'm waiting until we can, I can absolutely open out and start in-person training. Um, however, I am sort of sharing, um, you know, the initial of, um, of just what the process is online. So that, so with those um, online um, workshops, the intention is for you to learn about the process of the intimacy coordination to integrate it into your own practice. So if you're an actor to integrate it into you helping you um, have the language to know what the process is to be able to offer to a production um, if you're asked to do intimate content or if you're a director you know that to, to teach you you know what again as we said language what the process is that you integrate that into your best practice and into your your um how you hold the space as a director um, um, and that's really important that's the first step so come seek out and see if you can come to one of those workshops as far as intimacy coordinator training which is a really robust training. And also it takes a long art because it's obviously, it's not just a training. It's also then putting that work in practice, being mentored. So I have a re really robust, um, that period of being mentored, I ask for 50 days work on set over a minimum of five productions of which a maximum of any one production of 25 days on set. 
so, so that it means that, you know, because a lot of this job isn't just what you deliver, but how you adapt what you deliver, how you hold the space uh, and, you know, the different personalities of be it the director or the first AD or the actors. That's where, you know, the, the real nuts and bolts of, of really learning how to be a robust intimacy coordinator come into place. Um, and that whole arc takes about two years. Um, so so if you if you feel that you're drawn to it and um and you have the skills. So skills wise, I ask for and it's a complex amount of skills because um you, you know, first of all, for me it comes from the bog standard actor director interrogation of script. So you have to understand that process of you know sort of interrogating a script um, and all of that. And then obviously body skills, you need to be able to know about anatomy of the body, choreography, um, you know, and, you know, have, you know, things like lab and um, five rhythms, body mind centering. So, to, so, you, so there's a gamut of different possibilities. You're practiced in that. Then obviously um, health and safety awareness, boundaries, um, and then understanding either, you know, how to work on film, how to work on um, in theater, um, each of those two different um, 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 you know, sort of um, if theatre and film have different requirements because, you know, the different length of rehearsals in theatre, you've got perhaps an ongoing performance that might like be a three week run, it might be a six month run. So, of course, there what you're taking care of is, is how you keep that um, intimate content safe over a long period of performance. Anyway, so those are all the skills I'm looking for. So it's a complex role. You need a certain degree of maturity. You need to be embedded within the industry um, and then and then come and learn. But if you still feel after all of that, that it's something for you, please get in contact with um, with the company. Um, if you go to um, the um, intimacyarmset.com and there's a, the contacts page at the end. Um, but yes, it's also very rewarding and very exciting. Yeah, and we'll put all of those links in the description as well. So if anyone does want to either either reach out with questions or, or just want to see if, if that's possible, we can do that too. Um, so I, I also want to just ask, a, this is a very general, very vague question about sex on screen and intimacy on screen, because as you say, things are adapting, things are changing rapidly and and representations of sex it's, it is now becoming a lot more commonplace with shows like Sex Education and Normal People. Um, do you feel like showing sex on screen is important or could it be gratuitous as we've mentioned before could it be too much um well as, as i've said before the too much is if it's not needed mm -hmm. you know um you know you want you want you want the 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 just the right amount of intimate content that that storytelling needs yes i think with the role of the intimacy coordinator what we do have the opportunity of doing is, is um, you know, through lifting the, the creation of the intimate content to have a professional structure, just as any other part of the scenes, you know, have done, um, means that we can create better work that serves the storytelling in a clearer way. Um, and so hopefully, um, you know, as you're saying, you know, normal people um, it's a uh, it's a sin, for example, you know, the intimate content in that was absolutely integral. It's about the HIV epidemic, which was at that, you know, you know, transmitted through sexual content. It's obviously it's transmitted through other ways as well. Um, you know, but the core of the storytelling was so important that it's that sexual content. Um, so I'm very proud of the fact that just through being able to interrogate and bring clear choreography, then the ripple effect has been that people from those communities have been able to say thank you for bringing the correct detail. For example, when Gentleman Jack came out, I heard the queer female community saying, oh, thank goodness, at last. Um, other than Saran Jones nails being too long um, <laughs> um, for a moment of, of, of um, you know, um, genital fingering, um, that, um, that, that, that thank you for us being seen in the nuance. And, in the, and I think it's uh, the sense of the, the gaze, you know, so I, I think up until now that, that the male gaze has just been the default mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with the male gaze. Of course, we want things shown from the male heterosexual gaze. What's important is that we become conscious that that's not just the default, that we want from the from the gaze of the LGBTQ community, we want from the gaze of, if, um, of all different religions, of all different sensualities and sexualities. That's what's important is that we tell stories from all different parts of our humanity and the intimate content that goes with that, the detail of that is correct. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm interested in. 
And then through just having that open conversation, we can help to achieve that in a better way than we ever have done before. So that's what I'm interested in. And yes, it means that we can open out and show better intimate content, including more realistic content. So I've been speaking with um, couples, sex couples, therapists, and you know, and, I, and I've been educating myself and my fellow intimacy coordinators in more of the authentic detail of you know our intimate arousal. Um, so, for example, the idea that sort of you can you know you know have a kiss and then suddenly you're ready you know if it's say it's a heterosexual sex scene ready for penetration um, you know within two seconds and it's like actually if that happened it would be painful we need lubrication in some way. Um, you know, so so this spontaneous arousal with penetration within two seconds, let's try and lift the myth of that. Um, um, yeah, the, 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 the journey of the male arousal, there's aspects of that about um, how um, an erection might come and go that's natural and normal. Um, another th um, therapist was saying to me things like, you wake up in the morning and someone turns to kiss you and they go, oh, go and brush your teeth first, you've got smelly breath. Though, you know, lumpy bodies, bodies that aren't six packs of bellies. You know, I'm a middle-aged woman I'm going to menopause. My body has shifted and changed. Let's let's have more normal, you know, depictions of, of who we are, what we are in our human form so that we can both delight in our sexual expression. I've, I've just been doing um, a project that's celebrating um, sexual our sexuality into our older years from like people from 60 to 80s and into their 90s. And to me, you know, that's just joyous, you know, and that nudity of, of, the, of the older body. You know, our older people hold such wisdom and, um, and such beauty and have such um, a wealth of um, information to, to share with us younger people, um, you know, both in all walks of life, but in particular, how you continue to be sexually active or, or you keep your sensuality going. All of that is joyous to me, and um, and I think we need to, to to keep showing more of the reality of that, um, and then hopefully, um, what's reflected out, you know, in our you know in our world is a, is a then a healthier depiction. Um, one of the sex therapists was saying to me they had a couple come to them, and um, and then when they described their problem, she said, "You are normal," but because that depiction um, that's seen on our on our television screens is 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 um you know doesn't show so there are the nuts and bolts and the and the and the reality of it and it's giving false expectations um and it's absolutely right and proper that we should have our fantastical um scenes that are from fantasy with beautiful bodies and things happening beautifully but we that's great because it should be entertainment it should be fantasy that's all part of what we look to for our television our films um, but we should also have a bit more of, of the reality and, um, and the truth and, and enjoy that. That equally can be equally beautiful and equally entertaining. Um, but I think it's really important. And I feel that's part of my role. And I'm looking forward to helping to talk with productions to, to bring a bit more of that in um, and, you know, to continue to have people delighting in being seen um, in, in their TV and film. I think, yeah, absolutely. And, and before, I mean, before this session started, we had a chance to chat about um, being seen and, you know, the, the work that you've done with sex education and it's a sin is, it's just so refreshing to see that those are real people and real moments that happen in real lives. It's just, you know, it's, it's so lovely. So um, I'm sure not only I'll be thanking you, but everyone, everyone watching as well will be uh, absolutely, you know, delighted to see to see more stuff like that happening on our screens so I'm just going to wrap up um with I just want to know kind of what uh, a positive experience that you've had on set uh, one that epitomizes good practice or one that highlights the role on set I know you've had like a million projects that are massive and really really great um but yeah just for a, what what one do you think epitomizes good practice well what's coming to mind I mean you know that there, I have had many, many times that I've had really, really challenging situations, um, and there've been times that I've come off set going, "I don't know if I can do this job." Um, when you've had productions that have called you in because they want you there to check in with the actors and then stand back and do nothing, and they're saying, "We actively do not want your choreography," you know. So, so though, so so, you know, and just old school where uh, we're called in and. Um, and the the role and what we can give isn't really understood. So there's there's that's still happening, 
And I feel that where the actor might have been at the, the sharp end receiving the brunt of uh, an industry that enjoyed, you know, sort of not really wanting to put in place best practice. So, so, um, so we've got a long way to go. But every single time that I have the opportunity, perhaps I'm doing a check-in with an actor and they're coming to me going, oh, I've never done this before. I'm really scared. How's this going to work? Um, you know, and I'm able to go, right, this is, this is the process. This is how it's going to work. And then we have the day on set and um, they create a scene that, that nails it, that, you know, brings all the beats, brings all the storytelling that the director wants. And I check in with them the day, the day later and then go, wow, I feel so proud of what I did. That was an amazing scene. And this is my gold standard in how to create this scene. And I will never accept anything else. And, and thank you. So every time that that happens, I'm going great. I've done my job well. And, um, and then, you know, when the scene comes out, I know that not just has the scene served the storytelling, but the health and the joy of, of the actor's process and the actor's experience as well being something so positive mm -hmm. that every time that happens, I'm, I'm, it makes me very happy. I can imagine. I can imagine. It sounds like, you know, it's, it's such a, it's obviously such an important role and uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to chat with you today and hear about your processes and uh, hopefully I'm sure as well, I mean, it's going to help with a lot of young people and a lot of independent productions as well going forward if you want to know more about ETA uh the links are all in the in the description below so there's uh there's a few websites and a few social medias so you can reach out there and find out more information there um but so can I just say can I just say so for any so my as I've said my pathway is that my actors have to accrue hours um on you know days on set for experience um and that's under mentorship um so if someone's got a low budget, um, you know, um, please get in contact because I've got my people under mentorship who need experience. And for you to have a practitioner who has been trained and invariably my practitioners have, you know, a whole gamut of um, experience in their own right. So I've got people who have been actors or choreographers who, who, who have like 20 years experience already. So you're not getting some novice who then can come and be your intimacy coordinator for a low budget. Um, and it's a win-win. You're getting someone who's putting in place really good practice as an intimacy coordinator and um, intimacy on set is getting an opportunity for my intimacy coordinators under mentorship to gain experience. So if you've got a low budget um, production, please come and contact us and we'll do our best to place someone with you um, who can really um, you know, support your production. Yeah, that's such a valuable asset. That's such a valuable uh, tool. So definitely reach out if you're watching this and thinking for your night's film you need an intimacy coordinator I'll put on a low budget um thank you everyone for watching the tackling intimate scenes master class with Ita o'brien at the indus festival we've got loads of sessions that are completely free on this channel including a master class with one of Ita's sex education colleagues actually script supervisor natalie shikluna uh plus the 10th uh on the 10th of april we're hosting a q a for the film you cannot kill david arquette with a very special guest david arquette <laughs> obviously can't kill him uh, so make sure you uh, follow us at Indies Festival and keep the conversation going on Twitter using hashtag Indies2021. Ita, thank you so much. And we'll speak soon. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you, Gage. <laughs>